Welcome to the Good Growing Podcast. I am Chris Enroth, horticulture educator with University of Illinois Extension, coming at you from Macomb, Illinois. And we have quite a fun show for you today. We're going to be talking about monarch butterflies and all different types of pollinators. We are going to have Kelly Alsop. She's a horticulture educator with U of I Extension. But before we get to Kelly, let's introduce our co-hosts here. We have Katie Parker, local foods educator in Adams County. Hello, Katie. Hello there, Chris. How are you doing? Uh, I am just peachy here in my basement. I got my dog next to me. He'll he'll either sleep or bark. We'll find out what happens. So <laughs> we'll, we'll have see. a surprise. Yes, but I, uh, you were saying before we uh, got recording here that the storm has uh, rolling through Adams County and it is getting dark here right now. So we're looking forward to some rain after a long break of dry weather. Yeah, I think it might hit the whole state of Illinois. It looks like it stretches the entire length. So uh, it's a much needed rain. Yeah. Yeah. Looking forward to it. So, you know, for the most part, I've seen crops are out of the fields right now. You know, so farmers, we're just waiting for some rain to kind of replenish that soil so we can get ready for spring. Absolutely. And we are joined by horticulture educator Ken Johnson. Ken is in Jacksonville, Illinois. Hey, Ken. Hello, Chris and Katie. I don't think the rain has gotten here quite yet. It's still sunny outside, well, but the wind has picked up. Yeah, and I can see the, I mean, it's very sunny there uh, where you're at there, Ken. Um, it's a lovely picture. What do you have behind you? I have a rose with a surfed fly, hoverfly, whatever you want to call them, well, feeding on the pollen, pollinating it. Ah, that is going to be appropriate for today. It is. So, um, Ken, you are really taking advantage of that green screen. So now I think we all need green screens, change up our backgrounds. I love that. Yes, we've got it uh, rigged with PVC and held together with clamps and clips. And I'm going to have to do a little more professional job for the next one, but it's, <laughs> it's holding for now. <laughs> well, until it collapses, if it holds out for the episode, we'll be good. So, all right. Well, folks, we are joined by Kelly Alsip. Kelly is a horticulture educator here at U of I Extension. Kelly, you're based in Bloomington, normal area. So welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. It is definitely uh, windy here. It's not raining. We would love some rain, though. I mean, it did rain maybe a couple of weeks ago, and the ground is bone dry. So mm -hmm. I am excited that it's going to rain throughout the entire state, so I don't have to go and water. That's right. Yes, our, our colleague, uh, Martha Smith, she just posted a video about deep watering evergreens because we got to make sure that they have plenty of uh, soil moisture as we go into winter because they hold on to their leaves and to them, winter can kind of be like a drought. So you have to make sure that they have good water resources there. So, but we don't have Kelly here to talk about rain, not necessarily, but we have Kelly here to talk to us about pollinators and uh, insects. And so um, Kelly and, and Ken are both um, the like-minded individuals and in their love for, for insects. And I, I call them all things uh, spineless or those who wear their skeletons on the outside. So uh, Kelly, I want to start... Oh yeah, I think that's that's the way insects, we should be thinking about them. Um, I wanted to ask you right off the top here, um, there's been a few articles in the news about monarch butterflies. Um, some of them are showing that there was uh, a, a lot of sightings this year. Other articles are also though suggesting that their overwintering numbers are not as high as they normally are. So Kelly, do you know our monarch butterflies still in trouble? They are still in trouble. Um, you know, I don't know how the counts are, but this is what it, te what tends to happen is um, last year in the spring when monarchs were uh, leaving their overwintering spot, we had a, another 53% decrease in monarchs. And that is very concerning. Um, it, it could be many things that are contributing to that. Um, what we've noticed is that um, when the monarchs actually get to Illinois, they're actually 
sustaining their population, their population builds really high. And it's not really Illinois that is the major issue right now, um, that it's other potential environmental things. Like stuff like early droughts, it, especially in those lower states, really wreak havoc on monarch numbers. You know, late frost um, can wreak a lot of havoc also. I do think, you know, we, we would be uh, remiss not to say that climate change isn't affecting um, the monarchs because of those extreme environmental conditions. And, um, you know, you know, I wrote an article in 2017 from after reading some of uh, David Zaya's work, and he is um, a University of Illinois entomologist who does specifically work with monarchs. And what he was saying was, even though our population of milkweed plants is, we don't have as many as we used to, we're still building up those populations with what we have in the natural areas, what we have in people's gardens. But what was happening was he was concerned that they were unable to get enough nectar to make the journey south in the fall. And he thought that was a huge contributing factor to monarch decline. So it's not just a, you know, when it comes to monarch butterflies, it's not just I'm planting milkweed, I'm contributing to monarchs. Yes, you are contributing to monarchs, but there's other things that monarchs need and specifically floral resources in the fall. And that, that's kind of something I've been hearing. I, I know um, Extension recently had uh, Dr. May Berenbaum on as a webinar, um, did Dr. David Zaya, and, and they're all saying this is a complicated issue. There's, it, it's not just like climate change. It's not just pesticides. It's a lot of these things coming together and impacting uh, monarch butterflies. And, and I, I think for a lot of our programming efforts here in our local area, Yes, we do use monarch butterfly as kind of this poster child mm -hmm. for habitat loss, uh, kind of overuse or misuse, I would say, of pesticides, climate change. Um, but the things that we do to help improve the life livelihood for monarch butterflies improves habitat for all types of wildlife. So uh, for listeners and people watching, you know, just, just know when we talk monarchs, we are talking all different types of species that we can be impacted. Yeah, if you garden for a monarch butterfly, you're gardening for you're gardening for bees, you're gardening for other pollinators. It's definitely important. One thing that was so profound for me when I was listening to May, of course, um, we know uh, Ken and I probably uh, really look up to May. She's our hero, right from the U of I. Um, she's just this she's a wonderful speaker, but you know, that she said she's not re ready to um, say that we are having a pollinator apocalypse. And the reason she's not ready to say that because we just don't know enough about insects. And I think that point is really important that when you talk about monarchs and honeybees being the poster child, the reason is, is because those are the insects that are getting the most attention and all these other insects, other pollinators are not getting the attention or even the, the scientific observations that they need for us to even say, hey, we're in the middle of a pollinator apocalypse. And then I learned a few things from her um, about, you know, not what not to do um, in our home environment. And it, it was pretty, pretty, uh, pretty cool to hear that. Uh, the one new thing that I learned from her during that talk was not to leave your outdoor lights on. I had not really considered that. I'm sure Ken, Ken, you've heard of it, right? Do you leave your outdoor yes. lights on, Ken? Yeah, ours are all burned out. <laughs> oh. I haven't replaced the light bulb, so they can't turn on. <laughs> okay. So, you know, she was telling us that, you know, don't leave your outdoor lights or use uh, different kinds of bulbs. What was the kind of bulb that she wanted us to use? I can look it up. Well, Kelly, I, I read your article. Did you post that 
yeah a week ago two weeks ago and because of that so i have led bulbs out in my front yep. yard LED area bulbs. and i i can change the colors so i you said was it switch to yellow yeah yellow uh, yellow hued hued led lights mm -hmm. and that incandescent bulbs are the worst kind of bulbs that you can use yeah. because it what she said it was is the um, night pollinators, which we think about the ones in the day, but we don't always think about the ones at night, exhaust themselves around those lights when they really should be out pollinating, right? Instead of flying towards those lights. So just a simple turn your lights off at night could really help um, pollinators in the long run. I thought that was a really good point. And with the lights, don't use bug zappers. The mosquito zappers, they don't really catch mosquitoes. It's all the other moths and lace wings and all kinds of other beneficial insects that they catch. And the same thing, what 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 are we thinking of? What What's happening right now is leaf blowers. Leaf blowers can be really, really devastating to insects that are overwintering. And um, we really need to, you know, rethink, you know, how we use our leaves. I mean, I never put my leaves on, on the, in, here in Bloomington, we just put our leaves on the side of the road and then a truck comes around and it like vacuums up all the leaves. So nobody in Bloomington puts their leaves in bags. So, um, you know, one of the things that uh, I, I understand that if you leave leaves on lawns that you're gonna kill out the lawn. But one of the things that you're doing is um, you know, it's like we're planting these particular trees, let's say we plant an oak, and we know that there's lots of lepidoptera, which are butterflies and moths, that feed on that tree, but then when it's time for them to overwinter, all the leaves fall off, and then we clean it up, and so we're not really allowing them to complete their life cycle, so one of the things that I constantly am trying to get gardeners to do is Put those leaves in their um, beds um, around their perennials or put those leaves in a compost pile and um, you know hopefully some of them will actually um, survive and actually come out in the spring or complete that life cycle the same with the stems of plants we you know um, 30 percent of solitary bees overwinter in the stems of plants we need to leave that there for them and then when we go to clean up in the spring, we need to, you know, kind of put all that debris in the backyard. That way we're not throwing away what they, they could still potentially come out. Ken, I know you have something to say about that. Sorry, my internet was <laughs> glitching. So <laughs> you were saying something, I didn't hear it. I said, Ken, I know you have something to say about that. About fall garden cleanup? Yeah. Be lazy. Be late. That's, yeah. I can wait till spring. <laughs> And it can wait till late spring, you know, the, you know, can, uh, we read the Heather Holm book and she says, you know, really wait, wait, wait long into the spring until you actually start to see new growth to even see four to six inches of new growth. And uh, that's when you uh, prune them back. So if you're really thinking about the bees and then don't, till because the se other 70 percent of the solitary bees are living in your grounds and what's the first thing we do when we want to start a garden is we till 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 and so we're actually um farming bees in the long run and for that garden cleanup in the spring kind of a, a good rule of thumb is when you would plant tomatoes outside that'd be a good time to start <clears throat> well, i'm gonna have to use that up. one so here in kind of central illinois that's kind of early to mid-may um, was when you would kind of start thinking about if you want to wait that long. And in some situations, you may not be able to wait that long if you live in a homeowners association or you've got some of these rules you have to follow. Um, but ideally, yeah, wait as long as you possibly can. And if you would have thought about, let's say, if you would backtrack Ken and I 30 years ago, what would Ken and I as horticulture educators say? We would have said, clean up your landscape. And the reason we would do that was because we would want you to clean up your landscape in order to prevent pest and disease outbreaks. 
but you don't have to clean up your landscape if you don't necessarily have those pest and disease outbreaks. And most of the time, if we do have that, it's very minimal. And then those are the plants you do clean up in the fall, but everything else you don't, you don't clean up. So that's what, that's Ken and I's thing. We give you permission to be a lazy gardener in the fall. You're doing but best. Tell your spouse we said it's okay. Thank you. Right. And my neighbors too. Yes. And, and then if you want to pile up all your debris in the backyard and your leaves in the backyard and your wife gets mad at you for having all that debris around, you say, hey, the, that's for the overwintering insects, honey. Yeah. And, and I'll just let her know, uh, Ken said I could borrow his wood chipper once I give Katie back her core aerator. So, <laughs> so another thing that um, she was talking about, um, about the, um, the pollinators is, you know, we, we, we constantly, I know, Chris, you're going to cringe when I say this, but we, we put so much effort into lawns and they're basically a wasteland for insects and pollinators and wildlife. And is that something that we as a society want to continue with? Do we want to have pristine, perfect lawns or do we want to create habitat for wildlife? And I do think as gardeners, we've changed. I mean, you guys work with master gardeners all the time. It, you know, you know, some of them aren't going to ever be, you know, changed. They want that pristine, perfect lawn, but some of them are like, yeah. And then, you know, that, that bee lawn program out of University of Minnesota, I would love to experiment with that. Um, I tried doing some ground covers, uh, some ground cover trials, um, kind of living mulches um, in 2019, where I, um, planted uh, clovers and thymes in with um, at the vegetable gardens and um, they they came back um, they were easy to take care of in, initially there was some weed pressures and that you know was the only thing that I had to do in the very beginning was to get those weeds out of there once I started it but after that it became much easier to handle um, easier than lawns because I didn't have to mow. You know, my mom's planted some of the creeping thyme um, in some areas around her deck that are kind of hard to mow and it's filled in quite nicely in the last year or so. And it, it smells good. It's got flowers on it and stuff. So and I, they probably can't handle much foot traffic, but if you kind of got out of the way areas where people don't really walk or, or anything, mm -hmm. those, are, those are good alternatives. Especially places that are hard to reach with the mower. Why not plant a nice ground cover that is going to attract pollinators? So even though, you know, a lot, you know, we've had this major decrease in monarchs in um, December 2020, um, there's going to be a major decision made. Um, are we going to include monarchs on the endangered species list? So that will be interesting to see and um really what that means to the rest of us, to extension educators or gardeners or people who are trying to work with monarchs, I mean, what exactly does that mean? Does that mean we don't get to raise them anymore? Does that mean that um, more areas will be protected? Um, it's really, it'll be interesting to find out what, what will happen if for sure they're, they are put on the endangered list and then what that means to the rest of us. So speaking of monarchs, kind of one of the ways that this kind of marketed or talked about is kind of helping those populations is making monarch way stations. You mm -hmm. want to explain what exactly a monarch way station is? Yeah, a monarch way station is just a garden that you create that provides the resources that monarchs need with the, you, of course, you have to include milkweed. And in fact, they would like you to incorporate at least 10 milkweed plants. They would like for you to use two different species of milkweed, whether it be swamp milkweed or butterfly weed or, you know, um, um, 
not the really the common milkweed, not a lot of people are going to use that, or the world milkweed, which is a really interesting milkweed grown in prairies everywhere. Um, definitely the swamp milkweed is the most preferred by monarch butterflies. The common milkweed is the most um, used because we have uh, more common milkweed than uh, any of the others. Um, another thing is, you know, butterflies, I love it when people say, uh, and uh, Ken says this all the time, what sun exposure do butterflies need? Ken? Full. Why? Do butterflies need full sun so they can warm themselves up and fly and most of the, the flowers they're going to visit are going to be in full sun too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we, we think about um, shade plants like hostas, which are very the when they flower uh the pollinators love it the butterflies aren't going to go to those plants that are in the shade only some of the bees and the flies might go there so they absolutely need sun they want you to plant the close the plant the uh, plants closer together which i'm all for this concept if you, you've listened to me at all in the future it's like we put these we put like five or six plants in a garden in this wasteland of mulch. So um, it seems like we don't plant enough plants to get a full garden in two or three years to where it's, there's not a lot of maintenance. So they want that. Um, another thing is they want you to provide nectar, which is very important because, you know, without the, um, they have their larval source. They, there's so many different nectar plants to provide for pollinators and monarchs. And then they want you to follow good gardening practices. And so the monarch way station is very similar to a University of Illinois um, program called Pollinator Pocket. And that's the same way where you design this, uh, they actually give you um, designs that you can, you know, download off the internet and actually recreate them in your backyard in a four by six pollinator pocket. And so then what happens is they'll give you, they'll let you, um, both programs will let you identify your garden as that and they'll send you signage. And that way you can uh, identify to the public, hey, this is a monarch way station or hey, this is a pollinator pocket. So really it's just a garden that helps educate the public, this is what it's for. And um, so those are two really great programs to be part of if you want to have a garden that is for monarchs or pollinators and you want the signage to be able to educate people that walk by. What other citizen science efforts are being done to help monarchs and other pollinators? You know, some other projects that are a little bit more intense, a little bit more um, community science aspects to them. Um, one of them is for, through the University of Illinois, it's called I Pollinate. And what we do is we did, we did a pollinator pocket design, but we didn't do it out of the native plants that traditionally um, are in the pollinator pocket designs. We did it with other annual plants. The reason we did this is because to get someone to adopt native plants can be quite a challenge. Uh, Ken and Chris and Katie all know this, you know, you can say, hey, plant lots of native plants, and they don't give gardeners the look they're always looking for. So what we did is we picked out some ornamental annuals, the really popular ones, the ones that sell um, a lot in the industry, geraniums, um, sweet alyssum, uh, uh, fan flower, uh, angelonia. And we want you to um, plant this garden with the, using those, an, those annual plants. We have a list you can pick from different ones. And then we also want you to plant swamp milkweed and we want you to plant new swamp milkweed. Um, he, it, he really wants information on newly planted. And then, so then what happens is you sign up for the garden four times throughout the growing season you're going to make observations on these plants. And you're gonna go up to that 
um, sweet alyssum, and you're gonna watch two of those four plants that you planted. And you're gonna watch them for three minutes. And then you're going to identify all the pollinators that came up to them. You're gonna submit that data. It's gonna go back to the University of Illinois. And that way we can actually make real scientific based recommendations on what plants you should be planting if you want pollinators. Um, you know, just the two years I've done this program, it's been really quite surprising to me because some of the best plants were, were stuff that I never have recommended before in, in my uh, career. Cleome, I didn't realize how amazing that plant was for pollinators. It tends to be the rock star of this study. Um, and then some of the ones that I would have thought were rock stars like Sweet Alyssum, it has not been that great of a performer. Another thing that really surprised me about it is that I would think that, you know, bees would be number one pollinators and that is not what's turning out. It's the flies that are the most reported pollinators. And once you can distinguish between a fly and a bee, it's, it's really, it's, you look at the fit, you look at the eyes, a fly, the eyes are huge on the face and they're close together. The bees, they're separated out, right? Yep. And uh, they always say, you know, two wings for the flies and four wings for the bees. But when a bee flies, it connects those two wings together. So it's hard to distinguish four wings. So I always say, look at the eyes. So I was really surprised that the flies are the amazing pollinators. They're the most prolific. Um, that's what we're finding in the study. Another thing that you do in the study is you record what, what's on your milkweed. You go, oh, there's these different, uh, you record the different instars, which after you teach yourself, it's really easy to distinguish between the five different instars you record eggs, and then you're supposed to take a picture of a bumblebee and upload it to Bee Spotter. Bee Spotter is a U of I program that's been around for a while and they really want honeybee and bumblebee demographics from throughout the state. Um, and they, cause right now, if you were to look at the Bee Spotter, Spotter map, guess where all the bumblebees are, Ken? Champagne. Chicago. So they really, really are quite interested in some of these um, um, less populated areas. So if you live in a less populated area, you're really helping them by contributing to these bumblebees. So you take a picture, which I think taking a picture of a bumblebee can be difficult at times. So if you're, uh, a, you know, an amateur photographer, this is perfect for you. You take a picture, you upload it, then they ask you to guess what you think it is. And then they go ahead and confirm um, what that bumblebee is. And so that's contributing to science. It's giving us some of that, that other knowledge that we need that's outside of just monarchs and honeybees. And um, so the eye pollinate, it's gonna be in its third year next year. We're already starting to gather some information where we're gonna be able to make recommendations to gardeners and people throughout the state. So that's what I love. Um, I want to make recommendations to people, but I don't know what to trust. And because how many times have you looked at a plant for three minutes straight? And before this project, never have, and I love pollinators, but I've never sat and looked at a plant for three minutes straight. And so it was a really fun experience for me. And, um, you know, I thought that it would, it's easy to do. And um, the only, the only, the only, the only thing that's not fun about it is uploading your information, but that's the key. You need to upload that information that, so that the scientists can use it. Okay, so we also have the Illinois Butterfly Monitoring Network. This is a really interesting one they, that um, is out of 
um, the Peggy Notabar Nature Museum. Doug Tarrant started this. Well, he he didn't start it. He became head of it in um, the nineteen the late nineteen eighties. And what they do is they educate you on how to identify butterflies, and then they have you they give you a location that they want you to um, check out throughout the garden season and submit results. And in the beginning, they only had about seven sites and now they're up to a hundred routes. So all you have to do is to go get trained on how to make the observations. They give you a route near where you live and you walk that route and help try to identify butterflies. It can be se seem intimidating at first, because I too, I'm like, when I see a butterfly, I'm like, uh, butterfly, could you hold on just one minute? Wait, could you land and open up your wings so I can properly identify you? Um, so they don't always listen, but I, you know, once you do something so much, it becomes easier and easier and easier to identify those. So that, I think that's a really cool program. Um, that's for the people who are really serious about butterflies, who like to walk in prairies or the different areas they assign. There's another program called the Monarch Larva Monitoring Project. Um, this is with University of Wisconsin in Madison. And it's kind of the same as the um, David Zaya where you report what kind of um, larva you're seeing on a monarch and you do it on a regular basis. So you could contribute to both of those at the same time with the same information. And that way scientists get that information. Another one that I thought was really kind of cool is you know how it's this big trend is to bring the monarchs inside. We do this for our kids, right? We want them to see the monarch grow and we want to see them, them you have see the monarch turn into a chrysalis and see the monarch turn into an adult. But we monarch people know that 10% of monarchs actually make it to adulthood. And the reason that they're not making it to adulthood, it could be several things, could be um, parasites, could be um, uh, uh, other insects, parasitic wasps, but there is a, um, um, program um, that is actually wanting you to send in some of these monarch caterpillars that you raise. I know you ultimately end up killing them, but they want you to send in specimens to see if they can detect um, this particular parasite. Now, Ken may have to help me pronounce this. O-E? O-E, O-E. O-E, okay. <laughs> that's, that's a tough one. <laughs> right, Who well, won't say the actual scientific name? <laughs> yeah, I don't think I could pronounce it, but he no. knows He knows O-E, and we, we hear this all the time where people will say, oh, my monarch didn't make it through its chrysalis stage very well, and it comes out really deformed. Or my monarch butterfly is not flying. And one of the reasons could possibly be this particular um, parasite that's in monarchs. And so these two scientists want to learn about those parasites and learn you know, how prevalent they are in the monarch population. So I thought that was a really cool one. Um, all of them can help and you can kind of like um, I thought that the, um, of course, I want people to do I pollinate because that's University of Illinois that gives us, you know, we're going to get all this stuff back. But the Monarch Larva Monitoring Project, it has so many different activities. You can pick and choose what you want to do. Um, you, so it's just really, you know, to your preference as to how, how you want to give back. And, you know, what's the you know, do this stuff with your kids. Um, you know, we're all at home right now and uh, maybe we'll be at home next time, next, you know, growing season next summer when the monarchs are out and doing this kind of scientific study with your kids can be really great. 
Um, I love science with kids. I will say a, a memorable moment of science for me in raising monarch butterflies is when uh, the, the caterpillar went to go into its pupa stage, the J. Mm -hmm. And it stayed there and it didn't move. And then all of a sudden, these little maggots started dropping out of it <laughs> and they fell to the bottom of the cage. And then th those maggots, these parasitic flies went into their pupa stage. That was, uh, my kids were just watching it in horror, like, what is happening? I'm like, this is nature. This is life. It is. This happens. This happens out in the wild. This is, you just brought it inside. That stuff's uh, awesome. That, I mean, it goes to show you, you know, even though we're, 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 supposedly we're raising this huge amount of monarchs here in Illinois by all the different milkweeds we have to provide, you know, really only 10% are actually going to make it to adulthood. Yep. And there are other species that rely on monarchs for food, for their life cycle. So it's, it, it's all ties together. And Kelly, speaking of tying this all together, we have some questions that have come in uh, Wonderful. from listeners, watchers, homeowners, people calling in the extension office wanting to know more about pollinators. So would you mind helping us answer some of these questions? I would love to. Fantastic. Ken, go ahead and kick us off with our first question. All right. Our first question, um, we are going to start a beehive next spring and would like to plant pollinator plants. What seed mix should I use? How big should I make the area? Well, <clears throat> I love it when people are like, how big? As big as you're willing to go. Can I say that? You know, um, some of these pollinator gardens, their, their minimum size is 100 square feet. Um, when it comes to, you know, those bees, those you want to make sure that um, you have something that's blooming year round. One of the things that I think bees really suffer with is a lack of early floral resources. I um, mean, they start coming out of um, hibernation uh, from overwintering and uh, they have nothing to eat. Um, and then, you know, some of the times, like for instance, we have dandelions and violets and we're, you know, I don't vote, mow my dandelions and violets till I actually start seeing trees start to flower in the spring. That way they'll have some sort of resources as far as seed mix is concerned, I do not know. I um, mean, one of the things that um, I think is important is native plants. I think when it comes to bees, you cannot go wrong with herbs and allowing them to flower because the bees tend to like those little tiny flowers. Um, maybe Ken can help me. There's a lot of like commercial seed mixes available made for pollinators and there's I would imagine there's some probably kind of specific to honeybees um, if there's certain beehives um, you know they if they have a local um, beekeeping association or they contact them Illinois State Beekeepers Association probably has some information kind of specific to honeybees and there's I know there's books and stuff out there so there's off the top of my head I couldn't tell you a mix but there's there's a lot of information on specifically for honeybees Kind of mixes you can use and stuff but yeah kind of like what you said kelly just kind of that season long especially that that spring and i think fall too we get, kind of get a dearth a lot of times too in the fall and kind of what you said kelly don't disregard the woody no. plants either um the some of those smaller native shrubs are very early flowering so i well at our old house our neighbor had a a red maple that flowered super early every year and you could hear a buzz above your head when you walked because of all of the bees and other other like lots of different pollinators that were nectaring on on the maple flowers because there was nothing else. In the yeah, area. and like the black tupelo, where the flowers aren't necessarily that ornamental, and you know horticulturists we love it because it has such beautiful fall color. But it's, it should be used more. People should plant that tree more because the honeybees just love it. So yeah, um, having you know some of those woody plants, I think, is uh, really really important. And to go back, you know, when I talked about that bee lawn, 
you if you go to University of Minnesota, they have some bee lawn seed mixes where they're, um, you know, they have the clover and the prunellas and some of the different um, um, ground covers for the bees. So it seems like there's been a lot of monarchs coming through late this year, mm-hmm. but all the goldenrod has finished flowering. What are some late season blooming plants that I can put in my yard for monarchs? Um, one thing um, that I think is, and I can't remember the scientific name of this particular plant is um, um, can the Hamamelis, the witch hazel, which is a late bloomer in the fall. It's a um, wonderful plant. Um, but, you know, most likely there's a lot of, um, a lot of them are, have already started flying south and we're not having a lot of them right now. So I would have said, you know, your sedums, your golden rods, your asters, your lead plants, that would be a, you know, wonderful to add to the garden. Um, but, you know, like for instance, I have, you know, all of my, uh, all of my um, annuals that I plant for pollinators, they're all dead now from the late frost. Um, maybe Ken can add to that conversation. So I've, in my yard, it was say November 10th when we're recording this and I've still got blanket flower blooming um, in my yard is still sending out blooms. Uh, one of my other annuals like the cosmos um, you know, those, those are dead, but those are still blooming up until that frost. So a lot of our annual plants would be good um, kind of for that fall bloom. I wouldn't necessarily rely on them because if we do get a, an early frost that may do them, maybe have the asters, the goldenrod. Those are kind of the, kind of the big popular ones. Katie, one of my rock star annuals this year was black and blue salvia. Once you plant that in your garden, you will always plant it because there were bees and hummingbirds and flies all over it throughout the entire summer. And it just just um, got nipped by the frost last week. So it was a long bloomer and just continuous bloomer and amazing for the for, for all the pollinators. It was, I would say, hands down my rock star plant. I mean, it's almost as good as sedum. I mean, people, sedum is an amazing plant. It will, sedum will grow and flower in shape. Uh, I know that we as horticulturists tell you to put it in, in, in the full sun because then it will be more floriferous, but I see it blooming in the shade all the time and there's still pollinators on it. Now, not the bit, not the butterflies, right? Because they need the full sun. But um, sedum is a rock star plant too. I mean, you just can't go wrong with planting sedum. And there's so many different kinds of sedum. You could plant several different kinds. Yeah, we've planted some sedum in our house. We've got a gravel driveway. So we've put it kind of along the driveway where it's mixed in with all the, the dirt. It's kind of crummy soil and it's, it's doing quite well in the, that kind of that crummy kind of real dry areas <clears throat> if you have something like that. It just seems to be a such an adaptable plant because I'm like surprised when I see sedum growing I'm like wow this is full shade crappy soil and it's doing just fine. All right so our next question um, I would like to put in, put a pollinator plot in the lot next to my house. We live in town and I don't want to attract bees. Are there any plants just for butterflies? Oh, Ken, you know what I'm going to say. I don't understand why you don't want to attract bees. Um, Most of the time, bees aren't going to sting you. They're, They're doing their business. If you're not out there, um, you know, virtually touching them, they're not going to sting you. Uh, it, it would be extremely hard for you to have a pollinator garden, a butterfly garden, where you're not going to have any bees. I mean, you plant it, they will come. Um, it, I, it, kind I wish, of, it kind of defeats the purpose of a pollinator garden. Yeah. Keep out. I, I wish I could um, 
I wish I could convince you that bees aren't bad and that bees are extremely beneficial. And, you know, Ken teaches us all the time, you know, where he uses the, the stat of if we didn't have bees, there were, there's so many foods we wouldn't have. Um, they're extremely important. Um, if you want a pollinator garden, I'm sorry, you can't pick and choose who's going to come. They're going to come if they're in the area. And I'd say if they're, if they're kind of real set on it, I would look at stuff that blooms at night. <clears throat> you're not going to see much of it, but that's going to be moth pollinated and you're not, you're going to have too many bees then. That's a good point. Uh, like a, a moon garden. Mm -hmm. Then you'll have the, the moths and yeah, but if you want something during the day, I don't think there's really much you could plant that's not going to have some sort of bee that's going to be attracted to it. And, you know, we don't just have the honeybees or we don't just have the big rock star bumblebees. We have all these little tiny bees that, you know, we can't even identify. They're just as important to pollination services as some of these bumblebees and honeybees. And then our last question is about fall yard cleanup. Should I cut down spent plants? People are saying not to bag or shred leaves. What's best for pollinators? I wouldn't cut down plants. I wouldn't bag my leaves. I'd keep the leaves in my landscape. I would mulch with them or I would create compost piles with them um, because they're important and it's hard to distinguish a leaf between a twig and a chrysalis at times, especially if you have, you know, certain trees that are attracted to, to larvae of certain um, butterflies and, um, you know, that your beneficial insects right there. It's not just butterflies, not it's your beneficial insects. So we, we all know about monarchs and this amazing journey they take down south, but think about all the other butterflies we have. We have 150 species of butterflies in Illinois and, you know, only a few of them, you know, that I can think off the top of my head, monarch or painted lady actually make the journey south. The rest of them are overwintering here in our landscape. So, Again, we'll reiterate, what, do, what, do, what, is Ken and I, what, what do Ken and I tell people? We give you permission to be a lazy gardener. And it's okay to have stuff piled up in your backyard or to start compost piles. Um, I, I know that in the middle of the compost pile, it's gonna heat up and it's probably gonna kill anything in there, but uh, you know, at least you're not putting it in a bag and getting rid of it or um, breaking it down into small pieces where you're killing them. Having worked at a botanical garden, I can tell you they put on a really good show, but if you pull back the scenes a little, you find piles of debris everywhere. And they do that on purpose because they don't want to haul it back to the shop. So they just pile up their stuff behind where people can't see. So, and um, it, even in the fanciest of botanical gardens, People are piling up sticks and leaves and all kinds of stuff. So definitely you have permission to be a lazy gardener. Yeah. Um, Ken and I would call that habitat. Mm -hmm. Habitat for so many things that could overwinter. And then and leaving some of those, those plants stand, you know, like a cone flower, the, those seeds can be food sources for birds. Um, some of the stuff that's standing provide some of that seasonal interest. Um, so you still have it you know, during the winter. It's not just, you know, kind of bare ground. You've got some different layers and stuff and that can catch snow and, and kind of add some, some beauty to the landscape instead of just being kind of nice and flat. I know when, when I, when I see brown hydrangeas, I think they're so beautiful and everybody thinks I'm weird. Why are brown hydrangeas not beautiful? Chris, Chris, are yeah. brown hydrangeas not beautiful? I got them in my backyard. I'm not touching them. I mean, they're stunning. Oh, yeah. And cutting mm -hmm. them back now would be a mistake anyway, right? Because we yeah. don't cut back that kind of stuff now. Um, it's, you know, be very careful when you cut back shrubs and trees that, you know, there's particular times of the year that you cut those back. But, you know, your annuals, just let them die in the landscape. Mine are dead. I have no intention of pulling them out. 
perennials, I have no intentions of cutting them back. Mm -hmm. I may do it in the spring, um, but you know, I'm going to experiment with the Heather home. I'm going to really let them grow out a lot. Like she would like for you not to cut them back at all. And then another technique she does is she'll cut some of the tips off. Like, let's say you had showy goldenrod in your landscape right now. Showy goldenrod is all full of seeds, right? And it's kind of laying on the ground, but Heather home wants you to clip the tips off. That way the bees will, it'll be easier for the bees to go down there and actually overwinter. But I don't think you have to do that. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. That kind of brings up the point when you do clean up, if you have those flower stalks leave six, eight inches behind. So you do have that, that potential nesting site uh, for bees and other pollinators. And then when I clean up in the spring, I always leave that in the landscape too. Cause I don't, if I, if I, if I were to cut down them too early and the bees haven't come out, then I just go ahead and keep them in the landscape and I don't try to compost them or throw them away too quick because I still want the bees to come out. And that's why when um, you'll see these prairies, when they um, have these prairie fires, they won't burn an entire prairie at one time. They'll only burn half of a prairie or portions of a prairie, and then they'll burn the other portions the next year because they don't want to completely devastate their pollinator uh, habitat for overwintering bees. You read my mind. That was my next question. Oh, sorry. Uh no, that was it. So I wanted to ask about burning prairies and I was like, well, well, all the insects in the, in the prairie, dead prairie plants, but you got it. So. Yeah, yeah. they, they did, they, they're very, you know, they only do little sections at a time because of that. I mean, I know it ha you know, they have to be very careful. I personally have never seen a prairie burn, Chris. Um, no, come I, on over. We're doing one, maybe Maybe this coming week, it, with the rain, it might not burn well. Maybe next week. Yeah, um, there's a, a, a prairie in uh, Woodford County called Letcher Basin, part of Parklands Foundation. They're wanting to do a fire, and I told them, here's my phone number. As soon as you know you're doing a fire, they're like, well, we'll, we'll only be able to give you a day or two notice. I'm like, yeah. I don't care. I want to come and see it. I want to record it, actually. I think it'd be cool. They're they're a lot of fun. Say so Dwayne Friend, um, I think he's got a YouTube video on the state um, YouTube page on prairie burn. So you can see some, I think he's got some drone footage of a prairie burn. Yeah, is that the next on your list, Chris? Do you have a drone? <laughs> As next on my list, I want a drone. What else do I want? I, I need a lot of things. I have lots of stuff on my list. So Tripper Shredder. Tripper Shredder, Corey Raider, all this, a lot of, a lot of things and a drone <laughs> to record it. <laughs> So, well, that was a lot of wonderful information. Kelly, also Porticulture Educator, U of I Extension, thank you for being on the show today. Thank you for having me. Well, that was a wonderful episode, folks. The Good Growing Podcast is produced by Wendy Ferguson and edited by me, Chris Enroth. A special thanks go to our hosts here uh, every single week to guide us through the topic of the choosing that they have here. We have Katie Parker, Ken Johnson. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kelly, for all the information. And thanks, Chris and Ken. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Kelly. And Chris and Katie, let's do it again next week. <laughs> and we shall do it again next week. We're going to be chatting with Andrew Holsinger about odds and ends and all of the gardening questions in between. We'll be promoting our upcoming winter webinar series that you can sign up for right now. Um, and of course, folks, we will leave links to all of the interesting citizen science projects that we discussed today in the show notes below. You know, folks, you're good at it for listening. Thanks so much for doing it or watching if you're watching us on YouTube. And as always, keep on growing.